The word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing the sun of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God may be thoroughly furnished for every good work. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly handling or cutting straight the word of truth. If you will, open the word of truth to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're continuing our verse by verse study of 1 Corinthians, and we are still looking at a question that Paul uh, is addressing or answering uh, uh, from chapter 8. In chapter 8, verse 1, we saw that Paul was uh, faced with the question concerning things sacrificed to idols. Uh, and the question was, should a Christian eat meat that had been offered to an idol? Paul made a distinction between the strong and the weak um, uh, Christians in chapter 10. Uh, he brought out that a Christian is free to do some things but it's not wise to do all things that we are free to do. Some things are not evil in itself, but it may not be wise to engage in everything just because it's not evil in itself. He's dealing with idolatry uh, because idolatry is very dangerous and the believer is to watch out for it. There were strong believers in the Corinthian church who were accepting the invitation from either family members or neighbors who were still unconverted to come to the pagan temple to eat at the uh, pagan feast. And the strong Christian felt like that they were strong enough that they had the knowledge and that they could go. They were in line, uh, um, but uh, they were enlightened that there was no such thing as an idol, but there, there is only one true God and Lord Jesus Christ. And so because they had knowledge that there is only but one true God, they thought that they, they could go to the pagan uh, temple feast. And, uh, but then there was other Christians who were weaker than them, uh, who were not as strong and thought that going to the pagan feast uh, were sinful. Uh, so in love, the strong believer should have uh, abstained from exercising their freedom uh, or uh, uh, abstain from going to the pagan temple because the weak Christian could be damaged. His conscience could be damaged. So by participating in the idol feed, the Corinthian exposed themselves to the danger of idolatry. Paul used the Jews in the past to, as an example of this danger of idolatry. Idolatry was the main cause of Israel's failure in the past. And so Paul is going to use Israel's example in the past and their failure in the past to warn the Corinthians about eating in a pagan's temple. So he warned the strong by previewing the Israelite example and failure. If you go to verse six, he said, now these things happen as example for us so that we would not crave things as they also crave. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and sit up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did and 23,000 fell in one day nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by serpent, nor let us grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man and God is faithful who would not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. So what we see here is that there were certain uh, traits 
that resulted in the character of the Israelite that resulted, resulted in God's divine discipline. Uh, they died in the wilderness and, uh, and those uh, 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 characteristics of sins were idolatry, idolatry, immorality. They tested the Lord to dare God to discipline them, um, to demonstrate his faithfulness, to discipline. They grumbled, they complained. We saw last week that when we grumble and complain, it demonstrates ungratefulness. It demonstrates that we're dissatisfied with God's provision. That's what Israel did when they was complaining about the manna in the wilderness. They were demonstrating that I am dissatisfied with God's provision for me. The Corinthian Christian was also dissatisfied with God's provision as the previous Israelite generation was. They rejected for example, the ministers who came to them teaching the word of God. They looked down on some, but they glorified other ministers. They had their preference on who they would listen to. Uh, even though God had provided all ministers to the church, but they had their preference on who they would listen to. They would not listen to Paul as they would uh, Apollos. Apollos was a very eloquent speaker Paul wasn't as eloquent as Apollo. And so they complained about God's provision would demonstrate selfishness. It demonstrate discontent with God have already provided. And what did it lead to in Israel history when they complained, it led to God's discipline. And so Paul is warning the Corinthian in doing the same thing. In verse 11, after previewing, uh, previewing the past example of Israel, he said that the, uh, the facts of the, the, these events was factual event, an example to believers. So in other words, believers then in the time of the Corinthians and also believers now are to be careful that they do not overlook the lessons of the past or they will repeat the mistakes of the past. In verse 12, here Paul gives a word of warning here to the strong. In other words, he's saying, don't be overconfident. Don't be overconfident. Now, when you go as a strong Christian, if you feel like that you can go, uh, I remember when I, when I got out of prison, I'm not gonna, go, when I got out of prison, uh, you know, 20 and some years ago, I wasn't finna get out and go and tell all my old buddies I'm out of jail. <laughs> that would not be wise, okay? Because bad company will corrupt good morals. I didn't even let anybody know I was out. I just went on about my business pursuing the Lord. And so Paul gives a warning, hey, don't be overconfident as believers. Don't, and you're overconfident when you feel like that I can go and participate in the pagan feast, because I am strong, I'm knowledgeable. I can go participate. Now that's being overconfident. They need humility and not self-confident. Self-confident lead to what? Spiritual failure. Spiritual failure. I see it done happen so many times. He said, therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed that he does not fall. So he's encouraging the Corinthian, be humble. Have some humility. Don't be... In yourself, you're not strong, but in Christ, you are strong. And see, you're going to fall victim to the spiritual failure of believers in the past. And that spiritual failure for being self-confident is idolatry, worshiping something else other than worshiping God. If you closely associate yourself with people who put people and things in the place of God in their life before long, you're going to find yourself putting people and things in the place of God, and that is idolatry. Don't be overconfident. The Bible tells us that we're not too close to associate with so-called Christians who are idolaters. And we read that in 1 Corinthians 5. Because if you associate closely a buddy buddy and spend a lot of time with those believers or unbelievers, you'll find yourself putting people and things in the place of God. And then he say it, it, immorality, it, which is the corruption of the conduct through sexual sin. 
You know, if you associate closely, you know, some of these believers probably, because, you know, in the pagan temple, uh, 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 the pagan, they had like a, a thousand prostitutes dedicated to the service of the pagan gods in the temple. You know, and, and if, if you got believers who say they're strong, they're overconfident, they're there eating a meal. You know that culture is very enticing. <laughs> it's very enticing. And it is, so it's not even wise to even go and eat a meal, uh, uh, close associate uh, yourself with these pagan because you could get sucked in to the culture. So by going to the pagan temple, they demonstrated their dissatisfaction in what God had already provided for them. You know, that sounds so much like believers today. They're dissatisfied with church, Bible class, Bible study, prayer meetings. You know, that's just too much. You know, you don't have to be all that Jesus. <laughs> uh, you don't have to be that Jesus. You know, Bible study every um, Wednesday and Sunday and prayer meeting. That's just too much. I'd rather go to birthday parties. <laughs> I'd rather go hang out with, with my, my buddies or, or, you know, or whatever. And those things may not be wrong in itself, but it may be take the place of God and what's really important. And that can be idolatry. See, humility is necessary to not fail or fall into sin. No matter how strong you think you are or these Corinthians think they are, they need not to go to the pagan temple. Family and neighbors may invite you to the pagan temple or the pagan feast, but you should not go. Even though you may be strong, you should not go because bad company can corrupt the believer's morals. You know, I hate it when, uh, when believers, when they're looking for their spouse and they meet this guy who is an unbeliever or a woman who is an unbeliever, and they tell themselves, they rationalize it, and they tell themselves, I'm going to change him. Good luck. No, you know what's going to happen? He's going to change you. Because that person, if they're not a believer pursuing the word of God, they cannot rise to your standard. They cannot come there. Okay, they got to get saved first and start growing in their spiritual life in order for them to even have the same values and standards and power that you have. You're not going to change them. I'm telling you, you're not. They're going to change you. Go to Deuteronomy 7, verse 1 through 6. Deuteronomy 7, verse 1 through 6. I tell people that, I tell you what, don't give your phone number out to him until he changed, until that person is changed. <laughs> well, I can change him. He's such a nice guy. He can provide me with security. Okay, all right. You ain't going to listen to Deuteronomy 7, verse 1 through 6. Look what it say. Deuteronomy uh, 7, verse 1 through 6. Come on, Aria. You're there quicker than me. 1 through 6. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 6. And the Lord your God shall bring you into the land where you are entering to possess it. And shall clear away many nations before you. The Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God shall deliver them before you, and you shall defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons. You shall not give their daughters to your for your sons. You shall not take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. But thus you shall do to them. You shall tell, tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars, and hew down their ashram and burn their graven, graven images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Amen. So here God has set, set this nation of people apart for his use and for his good pleasure. 
And so he told him, I don't want you intermarrying. See, God condemns a believer marrying an unbeliever. The only marriage that God really recognizes is a marriage between a believer and a believer and a unbeliever and an unbeliever. That's the only marriages that God authorized. But he do not authorize being unequally yoked because he knows that the unbeliever do not live by the same standard, do not serve and worship the same God. And as a result, some people willing to compromise their faith just to, hey, I'm getting old. I need to go ahead and get married before I get too old. <laughs> I need to go ahead and get, you know, everybody get married but me. No, don't rush and get ahead of God, but follow his principle. God time is, uh, is perfect. So here we see what will happen. Solomon did not listen. Look what happened with King Solomon. And he was the wisest man. This, that's a picture of the, the strong. He was the wisest man on the face of the earth. And yet he fell into that same sin. David, the greatest king, fell. No matter how strong you are. Look at Samson. Same exact thing. So no matter how strong you are, don't under, uh, uh, overestimate your strength. <laughs> don't overestimate. Go back to 1 Corinthians. But notice here, God promised victory, though. Even though we can all fall into these sins, we all can fall into these sins, but God promised victory in verse 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. Now, this word uh, temptation uh, simply means enticement to do something uh, is the Greek word parasmos, and it means testing, trying. Uh, it indicates intentional trying with the purpose of discovering what is good or evil about you, whether you're powerful, whether you're weak. Uh, and so the see, temptation is designed to see what you're made of, see what you're made of. And so Satan would tempt you, uh, and, and really, he knows that you're weak apart from God's power. To God have provided everything that we need to be victorious over temptation. But say no, that we are weak. We're weak. And so he tempts us. But God promised victory over temptation. And so I want to I want to kind of uh, talk a little bit about temptation before we go into the next section in this chapter. Victory over temptation. As a believer. The first principle we need to learn is this. We are never to position our, we're never to put ourselves in a position so that we can encounter temptation. That's the first thing, because that would be overestimating your, your strength. If you put yourself to encounter temptation, we never should put ourselves in a situation to encounter temptation. Instead, point two, instead the believer is to position himself for temptation because temptation is going to come longer you're here on this herb but we're to position ourselves for temptation not put ourselves to encounter temptation look at uh um uh, verse 14 here verse 14 say therefore my beloved flee from idolatry see that's the difference in putting yourself in a situation to be tempted. No, when I see it, I'm running from it. You know, uh, when I see it, I'm running the, in the opposite direction, not going to it, being overconfident, saying that I'm strong enough to be here, but I'm going to run away from it. That's one way you're not falling temptation is don't put yourself in a situation to be tempted. Look at First Thessalonians chapter five, verse twenty-two. First Thessalonians chapter five. Verse 22. I remember one time uh, I was I was I did a Google search and I was looking for some pictures of angels, okay? And I just Googled angels. <laughs> Y'all the man is laughing. The men laughing because they know what came back on the Google search. It was an angel, all right? 
And what do you do? Do you sit there and spit a, a couple of seconds? Of, no, you get up out of there. You close it. You get out of there. So, oh, I'm, I'm out of here. That's how you protect yourself is you don't go where you know you're going to be tempted at. You flee from it immediately. All right. Uh, somebody read verse 22 through 24, please. Um, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, I'm sorry. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 22 through 24. Amen. So here we see that we're to abstain from every form of evil. See, evil is not just sin. Evil is anything that takes the place of God could be evil, even if it's not may not be inherently uh, wrong. But we're to flee from anything that would try or attempt to take the place of God in our life. All right, uh, believer to avoid all appearance of evil. The Corinthian believer were putting themselves in danger by going regularly to the pagan feast. God had provided the, everything they need. What did God provide for the believer's escape? First Corinthians uh, uh, 10 verse 13, uh, uh, 13 said, God provides a way of escape so that we can be able to endure temptation. What is God's provision? for temptation. Well, one, this local church is one provision of God to not fall in temptation when it comes. In other words, learning the word of God. The word of God is God's power to overcome or uh, uh, be able to face temptation when it comes. Communion, when we observe communion the uh, first uh, Sunday of the month is another way to preserve or protect ourselves from temptation or is God provision? Because in communion, what are we challenged to do in communion? We're challenged to concentrate on our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so good to do communions all the time because it, 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 it challenges us to concentrate on Christ instead of all these other things. Also, believer who have the same values as we do is also God's provision. But a lot of believers don't want to hang around certain believers because they say, oh, they're just to Jesus. They're just to Jesus. <laughs> but that is God's provision for our protection. The word, the word of God taught in a local church, the spirit of God that lives in us, these are God's provision for our protection. Putting people in theme before God is always evil. It will lead to failure in the Christian life. And we should never uh, um, never underestimate the danger of idolatry or overestimate our own ability to handle these temptations. But we're to walk in close fellowship with Christ and other believers who share the same values so that we can be able to escape temptation when it comes. You know, uh, speaking of temptation, you know, there's three sources of our temptation as believers. Three sources of temptation. I'm going to give you those three sources. Three sources of temptation. And first, uh, go to 1 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians, 1 John. Go to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to look at the three sources of temptation. Three sources of temptation. 1 Corinthians Two, I'm, I'm sorry, 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17. Do not love the world. That's your first source of temptation, the world. What is the world? The world is a satanic system that is designed to corrupt your mind. It is a satanic system of ideas that are designed to corrupt your mind and lead you away from the mind of Christ. That's the world. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Your second enemy is the flesh. The flesh is your second enemy. This is your inside enemy. All of us walk around with an enemy living within us. I know that don't sound like good news, but 
God have given you the power to overcome that old you, that sin nature in you that is always tempting you to go back down that old path. And then you have your last enemy, who is the devil. The devil is the last enemy. Now, two of these enemies uh, is the source of outside temptation, temp temptation outside of our bodies. One of these enemies is from the temptation inside of our body. And so those are the three sources of temptation. But temptation have only one goal. Temptation only have one goal. What is the goal of temptation? Let's get them to function in their life without God. That's the whole goal of temptation. Let's get believers and unbelievers to function independently of God and his word. The world, the flesh, and the devil want us to function in our life independent of God and his word. Be your own God and you're going to find happiness. <laughs> that sounds funny. You know, I listen to, well, I don't listen now, but when I used to listen to a lot of the secular uh, uh, musician, they all incurred that same idea that if you want to be happy, be your own God, choose your own destiny, operate in your life in your own strength, in your own power, and you're going to find happiness. All temptation is a form of arrogance. That's arrogance. So all temptation really is a form of getting us into arrogance, <laughs> to get us into arrogance. It is to put yourself above God and his will and plan for your life because you know what's best for you. <laughs> That's the whole goal. That's the whole goal. And we are so ignorant because we're prideful. We can't really see that. Uh, let, me, let me close with, uh, with uh, a couple of scriptures, three, three exact. Hopefully I don't stand to get out of fellowship by saying three, hopefully not four. Genesis chapter 3. Go to Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Another mistake from the past. We can learn a really lot. We can learn a lot about temptation. We look at how Satan got E to sin. What does Satan do? Satan say, I want to test man's obedience. I want to test man's obedience to God. And that's what we see here in Genesis 3, uh, verse 1 through 5, is man's obedience to God is being tested. And whenever you're tempted, you're being tested as it relates to your obedience to God. And how did Satan get the woman to fall into temptation? Well, one, he's going to raise doubt in her mind about the truthfulness of God's word. Satan first want us to doubt whether the Bible is true or not. If he can get the woman to question the Bible, he already got her. He's going to get her. And then he will contradict God's word. And then he will get man to question the goodness of God. Let's see. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, and I know that he's attacking what God said. Has God said you should not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you should not eat from it or touch it or you will die. So, first of all, we see a problem here. Satan attacks the word of God, the woman's obedience to the word, and she tried to defend God by misquoting God. So Satan saw that, you know what? She don't fully understand what God has said. That is why it's so important for a believer to understand the Bible. And when you don't understand the Bible, it's very easily to be led astray and very easily to be deceived with lies when you don't know the Bible. But many believers, they're so uh, confident that they're intelligent enough, smarter than God, smarter than Satan. They don't need the Bible. I can do this on my own. I don't need the Bible in order to not uh, to, uh, to, to be overcomer. In verse four, the serpent said to the woman, oh, so he already realized that 
she don't fully know the word, you surely shall not die. See, that was a lie. For God know that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a light to the eyes and that the tree would desire to make one wise, she took from his fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her. And he said, whatever, honey, whatever, dear, whatever you say, yes, honey, yes, dear, instead of providing leadership. <laughs> so what we see here is the lust of the flesh, the pride of life and the lust of the eyes. Eve got deceived to think that something good can come out of disobedience to God's word. That's deception. Something good can come out of disobedience to God's word. And guess what? We're still buying into that lie today. Something good can come out of me rebelling against God's word, me functioning independent in my life of God. Nothing good came out of her disobeying God. Nothing. When given a choice, Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and nothing good came out of that. What does sin promise as we see here? Here's what sin promised. And sin never give us what it promised. Sin promised happiness, pleasure, satisfaction, freedom. But you know what's going to happen? It will lead to misery, frustration, guilt, bondage, death, and destruction. That's why God has provided everything that we need to escape from all forms of sin. He gave us his son. He gave us his word. His spirit lives in us. He gave us Bible teacher. He gave us a lo local church to learn and grow. He gave us communion. He gave us other believers who share the same values that we do. And our part is to utilize what God have already provided and not be discontent with what God have already provided. And I promise I will close Psalm 119. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Psalm 119, 9 through 11. And we'll close with this. One. Psalm 119, 9 through 11 is very simple on how we remain sanctified, remain holy in our practice. Verse 9 through 11 say, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart have I sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. So here we see, Brother Labby, your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you, that I may not give in to the temptation to seek satisfaction, to seek happiness apart from obedience to your word. And so here we see that the importance of utilizing what God provided, saturating our mind with the word of God so that we can put ourselves in a position to be ready when temptation comes. Let us pray. Father, Father, we humbly acknowledge that in ourselves, we have no strength. The flesh is weak, but through your power, we are strong. Help us all never, never, never overestimate our ability to overcome temptation. It is only through your power, and we are thankful everything you have provided for our victory in the Christian life. And keep us humble, keep us focused, keep us alert, help us to submit to you, because your word tells us in James, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Keep our minds and heart until we meet again. In Christ's name, amen.